Okay, hello everyone. My name is John, and we're going to be talking about deployment and patching. Let me share my screen. Uh, so, so um, before we begin, I just wanted to say um, if we could ask questions in the meeting agenda. And there are also some great questions from the last presentation we did uh, earlier. So uh, maybe read those as well. And, uh, you know, so we don't ask the same things. So uh, introduction, I'm John. I'm a senior SRE in the delivery team uh, working on deployment and patching. This presentation kind of serves as an overview of what we've been doing um, in the last month to improve deployment and patching for GitLab.com and kind of a general overview of how the release works. And that's where we're going to start is a release overview. I know a lot of people here are probably already familiar with this, but for those who aren't, uh, we release on the 22nd of every month and we do a code freeze on the 7th. And this is something that we've done for a while now. Um, so uh, sort of the, the clock starts ticking on the 7th and this is when the code freeze begins. And at this point, what we try to do is deploy to GitLab.com as quickly as we can with the first release candidate. And then subsequent to that, we continue to create release candidates up until the 22nd and then we make the official release. After the code freeze, uh, we are pretty selective about changes that we make. Um, and this makes it so that uh, there's a bit of manual work to try to see um, for, for, for the release team and the release managers and the delivery team right now to um, choose what changes go into the release. And then we move these release candidates through our pipeline. And the pipeline right now is staging, goes to QA, then Canary, then Canary QA, and then production. I also added a bullet here that mentions that not all RCs make it to production. Uh, we typically maybe average as release candidate a week right now, but not all of them will make it to production if we find a critical problem on staging. What we actually release is the Omnibus package. And this is the same package that we give to our self-managed, uh, to, to the self-managed community. It's a 600 megabyte Debian file for Ubuntu. Um, of course, we build this package for all different types of platforms. And it contains everything you need in one package to run GitLab. It contains the Rails code for GitLab EE. It contains Workhorse, Gitly, GitLab Shell, Pages, Registry, Sidekick, and GitLab Monitor. It also contains other binaries that you might need to run GitLab, like Postgres, Redis, Prometheus, and Alert Manager. For GitLab.com, um, what we do is we install this Omnibus across the entire fleet, and then we selectively enable or disable the services that we, uh, that we need or we want to disable. The other thing is also that we use the Omnibus for Redis right now. Uh, since we moved uh, our HA database uh, solution to Petroni, we stopped using the Omnibus Postgres, and we have our own uh, deployments of Prometheus and Alert Manager. Uh, Prometheus obviously is used for uh, monitoring, and we also have a Grafana dashboard, which you're probably familiar with, which is dashboards.gitlab.net, and the public one, which is dashboards.gitlab.com. Um, we also, of course, have Alert Manager, which handles, uh, you know, has, we have a lot of alert rule definitions for different metrics, and this is what pages the on-call uh, when we uh, have an issue. Um, we also, in addition to these releases, this, this, uh, these monthly releases, we also have uh, security releases that happen, and those have to be backported for the last three uh, releases, so that's something that happens every uh, month. And then I also wanted to talk, um, we'll be talking a bit in this presentation about, about what we do for patches. And when I talk about release patches, what I'm talking about are these uh, post-deployment patches that we create when uh, the code has been deployed to production and we find an incident, it could be a security vulnerability, it could be a critical bug or regression that we need to fix very quickly. And the way that we do this is that we patch production um, it skips a bit of the, it skips a good portion of the pipeline and goes straight to production. So here is the deployment pipeline. You can see that it's broken into environments. We have staging, we have canary, and we have production. Um, what we've done in the last month is we've uh, transitioned off of 
the previous deployment tool called Takeoff into a new deployment tool called Deployer, which allows us to, um, it, it leverages GitLab CI CD and it allows us to create a pretty flexible pipeline for deploying the Omnibus. Um, one nice thing about the new deployer is that it's flexible enough. Yeah, I'm sorry, you got muted. Oh, that's weird. Okay, so um, was I muted before or was? No, you, you went off with it's flexible enough. Oh, okay, that's strange. So you write at pipelines and it's flexible enough. I see. Yeah, I wonder what happened there. Hold on for a second. Okay, um, hopefully you, okay, so back to this slide. So we have these different stages and it's um, flexible enough where we can create a uh, staging pipeline uh, or a pipeline that goes all the way from staging to production. Um, each stage or actually each environment creates pre -check, or has pre-checks that checks for things like critical alerts, health checks for the load balancer tier and versions and things like this. Also at each environment we're adding or we've added uh, QA smoke, text, smoke tests that at the end of each stage uh, does a set of uh, tests using GitLab QA. Um, and for the Canary stage, what we do is uh, we run GitLab QA and we set the Canary cookies so that it checks uh, uh, just the Canary infrastructure. This sort of uh, gives you a nice summary of what deploying to a single environment looks like right now with the deployer pipeline. Um, what you can see here is that it was initiated with a chat ops command. Uh, York did a chat ops run deploy for 11.7 uh, release candidate 7, sent it to production. That kicked off a pipeline in the deployer project. And um, you can see that there are multiple stages and some, stage have a, some stages have a lot of jobs that run in parallel. And when it's completed, then we annotate our dashboard so that uh, you know, we can see when the deployment happened. And um, one of the advantages over our previous tooling is that since it's sort of designed to run in CI/CD, we're leveraging a lot of uh, you know CID, CI/CD features and just um, doing a lot of things in parallel. And um, it also allows us to like if a job fails, we can restart in the pipeline. Um, there's there's just like a whole whole lot of advantages for using this new tooling. Um, so. Basically, uh, when, we, when we deploy to a fleet of machines, there are a sequence of operations that happened. Um, to start off, a pipeline is initiated by, with two uh, variables, deploy version and deploy environment. And then we deploy to a lot of different fleets, sometimes in parallel, and we do that in batches of 10%. Uh, we can also deploy we can also, when we initiate this pipeline, and I mentioned this earlier, we can actually uh, pass in multiple uh, environments. So this would create a longer pipeline that goes like from staging to Canary. Um, but we don't currently do that now. If every Omnibus uh, installation, what it does is it um, goes through this sequence. And uh, I illustrated this in the diagram. This is the deploy gitlab.yaml, which is the definition uh, for uh, deploying to um, a single fleet. It does it in 10% uh, batches, and we first drain connections from HA proxy. We revert the current post deployment batches. We install GitLab EE Omnibus, and we install the new post deployment batches, and then we restart services if they need to be restarted or help Unicorn. Um, at the very end, we add the HA proxy, or we add the nodes back to HA proxy, and we wait for the HA proxy health checks to pass before we move on to the next batch of servers. I'm going to talk a little bit in this slide about uh, post deployment patches. And this is something that we've been doing for a while. It's gotten a bit better in the last month because we have new tooling that makes it, one, it's a little bit more self-service for developers. 
and two, it's automated through CI CD, which uh, means that we don't have to manually patch the fleet anymore. If you do need to create a post deployment patch, and this is usually for an S1 or S2 incident, what you do is you submit an MR to uh, the patches repo, and it's versioned by, there's a bunch of directories in there for each version. And you can test it on staging on your branch. And then once you merge it, it gets deployed in a pipeline all the way to production. I put some uh, bullets here that kind of explain the benefits of this new patching tooling. Uh, right now patches, for example, like before it was manual, now it's only applied to CI CD. Um, right now as well, uh, and this is fairly recent, um, patches can be reapplied on automatically on new deployments. So if we're deploying a new version of the Omnibus, and uh, we need to maintain a patch. And this is a fairly unusual thing for us, but if we need to do that, uh, the new deployer tool handles it. And um, another nice benefit is that the patching tools share the same configuration with the deployment tooling. So um, it's all using the same configuration code and um, it makes it a bit cleaner. I put a link here if you're interested in reading, interested to read a little bit more about host deployment patches, uh, so you can go to that link. So this slide uh, describes a little bit about the deploy tools uh, development. And um, we chose Ansible as a tool because it just suits very well this idea of like orchestrating SSH across many different fleets of servers. Um, it's batteries included, meaning that um, it, it, it includes a lot of the things that we typically do, like install packages, deal with HA proxy, uh, you know, shell out to commands and things like this. And there was a, a very small amount that Ansible could fig for getting this set up um, until like all, all in all, like there's probably, um, you know, less than, you know, a hundred lines of YAML just to uh, deploy to uh, production, which just makes it very simple and straightforward. Uh, we have a single repository that contains all of the Ansible config. And this repository is shared between multiple projects that have different pipelines. Of course, Ansible is Python based, it's not Ruby based, uh, but there's very little Python to write. The only Python code I had to write for this was a callback plugin for the annotations to Grafana, but other than that, everything is specified in YAML. And uh, I think one benefit we have to using Ansible and this tooling is that whatever direction we go in the future, uh, you know, it's, very, it's a very useful tool for us to apply changes across the fleet. And uh, we found this like, for example, with the registry restarter, which is something that we do once a day, which applies a rolling restart across the registry fleet. It has all these benefits, like all out of the box, you get uh, Grafana annotations, and um, you can also like take advantage of the HA proxy draining logic that we use for deployments. This kind of, this gives you a brief summary of the different projects, uh, the repositories that we use for the deployer and patcher. Um, there are essentially three projects right now that have pipelines, the deployer, the patcher, and the registry restarter. These projects just contain a GitLab CI.yaml. That's, that's pretty much it. And then they have uh, Git submodules for the actual tooling repository that contains the Ansible code. And then there's also the patcher project, which not only contains the GitLab CI, but it also contains the post deployment patches. So you can see in this diagram, the deployer actually checks out the patcher uh, repository as a submodule so that it can apply post deployment patches during deployment. Uh, let's see, I think that's it for this slide. And I wanted to add some links here for future improvements. Um, one thing that we're working on now is uh, directing all requests that are made to the GitLab com or org group. Uh, those are going to go by default to Canary and it'll be opt out. The advantage of this is it allows us to test more internal traffic on Canary. Um, it also allows us to test uh, traffic to other services like HTTPS Git and registry that use the GitLab com or GitLab org path. Uh, this does not mean that all GitLab traffic is gonna go to Canary. It just means that we'll have the ability to send more internal traffic there. We're also looking at daily deployments to staging. Uh, we have this uh, proposal uh, in flight for adding a one box environment, which is essentially before we deploy to all of production, uh, we can deploy to a single, uh, a single node in each cluster, which gives us uh, a little bit more data and metrics before we decide to promote to the entire fleet. And 
I just linked here to all of the things that we're doing to reduce the number of manual steps during releases, since it can be a quite a bit of toil when we do a, a release and we're trying to automate as much as possible. So I think that's the end and I'm gonna go to questions. And I do not see any questions. So I guess uh, um, since we're only 15 minutes in, maybe I can just open up to see if anyone has any questions on the call. I just added one in, sorry, Jarv. I was just looking and <clears throat> I didn't have enough time to look and try to answer it myself. What, where do you maintain the inventory for Ansible for the deployer and batcher? Ah, okay, so that's a good wow. question. The, yeah, so the inventory is actually just pulled from Chef. Um, there's a dynamic inventory script that goes out to Chef. It's, it's actually, I, I've modified it a bit, but it's fairly standard uh, or just something that the community wrote to pull inventory from Chef. So uh, we essentially deploy to, uh, to fleets by roles in Chef. And um, in the Ansible config, you specify uh, you specify a role, and this is actually done in the GitLab CI.yaml for each of the jobs, we set a role, and that role is passed to Ansible, and then that role ends up uh, being in the host list for the, uh, you know, deploy, the, the GitLab uh, deploy YAML file, and then that maps to a bunch of hosts. All right, are there any other questions? Otherwise, we'll just end early. Uh, I can take on the next one. So I have two questions. Uh, the first is rollback. So I, I'm glad to see that we have a naming convention for that rollback now. Is that we're still doing a roll forward mechanism or is, is it a true rollback? Like what, what's... Right, so what's um, the there, there's actually, a, there's, a, there's an open issue uh, for handling rollbacks a bit better than we do right now. Um, for now, the way that we roll back, um, there, there are two rollbacks. One is for post-deployment patches. And to roll back a post-deployment patch, we just, you just change the file to dot rollback and then the pipeline will just roll back the patch. Um, the other type of rollback is when we actually deploy an omnibus and we need to roll back the omnibus. For that, what we do is we just deploy with the same, with, with the previous version. And um, this deploys everything in the same order uh, we have an issue open right now because we deploy, when we go forward, we deploy to Giddily first, and that's because we can't be sure of backwards compatibility. And when mm -hmm. we roll back, ideally what we'd want to do is deploy to Giddily after the fleet um, to ensure that it's done safely. Um, if we ever do get, like often, like if we get all the way to production past post-deploy migrations and we have to roll back, usually we're trying to roll back as fast as possible. Uh, but, uh, you know, we are like looking into safer ways to uh, roll back. Got it. Thank you. Uh, my, my last one is um, around post deployment that involves database migration. So for context, we are, we cleaned up some of the database, database um, uh, discrepancies last quarter. Are there any processes that make sure that if a post deployment patch has a database migration, that migration makes its way into the, the thing to master and make sure that we don't have database schema discrepancies um, between production and what's in code. Um, so your, your question is, is whether there's a, a, a patch requires a migration? Maybe I didn't fully understand. Right, so if, if, if there's an S1 or S2 performance uh, that we need to address mm -hmm. in production, right? like we submit a, a post deployment patch that involves a migration or a schema change in a DB, it goes into production, but are there any guardrails to make sure that it makes its way back into, into master because uh, there's, we, we had to clean up some of this before last quarter. And I think it's just a matter yeah. of ensuring that the process is there, that the changes makes way back into master uh, specifically for all, all schema changes. Yeah, so actually, I mean, I, in my memory and, and maybe, maybe Stan can correct me if there was one, but I don't think we've ever had, it, at least recently we haven't had post deployment patches that require database migrations, but maybe you're talking about just patch releases I, I think or, you're right, John. I think your question, Mac, is uh, let's say we had to uh, submit a, a merge request that had a database migration that actually changed the schema. We haven't actually run in that case yet. Um, if I think there was one case where the approvers was not right this last release, and I think the database team manually just set reset some of those columns and wasn't actually in a migration. 
So it's a good question. I think we should open up an issue to figure out if this is a problem. If we ever have to actually roll a migration, then what do we do? Because we're not equipped right now to do that. Yeah, I, I have one, one issue and I, I, it, I'll involve um, Jose. I think we probably should open it up to involve uh, the del delivery team and, and you as well, Stan. I'll tag uh, Jarf, you and, and Stan on the issue and, and take it from there. Cool, okay. sounds good. And it, it kind of reminds me of the issue right now with post deployment migrations, because oftentimes we consider this the point of no return, but it happens during, you know, in our deployment pipeline for production. Um, post deploy migrations may possibly delete data from the database, like if it cleans up a, uh, you know, a column in a table or something like that. Um, so, you know, these are, these are discussions as well. And in the context of rollback, when those post deployment migrations should be run, maybe we should add a GitLab QA step before we do post deployment migrations, just to make sure that at least from our own testing, everything looks sane. Are there any other questions on the call? Okay, well then uh, we'll end it. And thanks for every, everyone for uh, uh, coming. And if you have any, if you think of any questions later, just feel free to uh, ping me on Slack. Thanks everyone. Thanks, John. This work is awesome, by the way. Thanks. Agreed. Thanks.